Ladies and gentlemen, dear distinguished guest, esteemed Ms. Brnovic, President of the Government of the Republic of Serbia, Professor Kostic, President of Serbian Academy of Science and Arts, Professor Heitor Gurguljano de Souza, President of the World Academy of Art and Science, Mr. Gary Jacobs, CEO of World Academy of Art and Science, esteemed excellencies, distinguished academicians, students, dear friends. It is with great honor and privilege that I welcome you on behalf of the organizing committee of the fourth conference on education, and I wish you a pleasant stay in Belgrade. Organizing this prestigious conference, international conference, is a great challenge and opportunity for our country to extend our traditional hospitality to foreign guests. Therefore, we are very pleased that World Academy of Art and Science and World University Consortium had such great confidence in us by nominating Belgrade to be the host. Preparing and organizing the fourth conference on education has certainly been a rather demanding project. On behalf of organizers, I would like to express special gratitude to our sponsors, and you can see the sponsors on this wall behind me. I would particularly wish to emphasize support of the government of the Republic of Serbia, and of course of the Serbian Academy of Science and Art, which is also one of the organizers of this conference, and particularly and especially of its president, Mr. Kostic. As you already know, as of 2013, World Academy of Art and Science and World University Consortium have initiated a series of conferences on future education. The first such conference was held in California, Berkeley, in October 2013, the second one in Rome in November 2017, and the third one in Rio de Janeiro in November 2018. Initiative for Belgrade to apply for hosting the fourth conference on future education, originated two years ago by and from the Serbian chapter of Club of Rome. Support to organizing these events first came from the Serbian Association of Economists and at the same time from the Serbian Academy of Science and Arts and later from University of Belgrade. We consider that the topic of the future of education was very important for countries such as Serbia which has been trying for years to complete the economic and social transition that started at the end of the last century. Dynamic and successful development of a country requires a high quality system of education. The volume, depth and speed of changes on a global scale are such that the time we are living in is said to be the time of fourth industrial revolution. Influenced by these changes and new technologies, methods of production, consumption, providing services, and communication are being transformed. New occupations emerge and the existing one disappear. According to available credible research, approximately 400 million existing jobs will disappear by 2030, and more than 260 million people will do jobs that do not exist today. The World Economic Forum experts estimate that by 2022, 48% of the basic skills for any job would need to be further developed. Having in mind dynamics of the changes, there is a high degree of uncertainty regarding the types of knowledge that would be required in the future. But it is already evident that even lower levels of education would require to develop knowledge and skills that would prepare individuals to find their way in a complex digital environment. The focus of learning is shift from memorizing to developing creativity, innovativeness, analytical and critical thinking, and the ability of lifelong learning. In other words, if we want to exploit the opportunity that brought about by Industry 4.0, we need to work on developing knowledge and skills of the population. 
At a time of knowledge-based economy, education and the educational system assume the role of the key development factor. Therefore, the agenda of fourth uh, conference on future education is very comprehensive and will consist of the five plenary sessions, and each of them will be followed by three parallel panels focused on the challenges and opportunities of future education. At the end, there will be an additional plenary session, which will include four selected topics of interest for future education. All in all, today and tomorrow, we will have a close to 100 distinguished speakers coming from 30 countries from all around of the world. Finally, with the last night's program, Welcome Chat, at the Ethnographic Museum, and with tonight's reception at the National Museum, in addition to the working part of the conference, we, as an organizers, try to show you uh, at least the small piece of Serbian history. I hope you enjoyed uh, last night and you will enjoy even more tonight. To all participants of the conference, I wish successful work and pleasant stay in Belgrade. Thank you very much. And now I would like to call Mr. Gorgolino de Souza to join me and to take this floor. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to greet, first of all, and uh, then the big president of the government of Serbia and Alexander Vlachnovic, president of the Serbian Association of Economics. I also would like to especially greet Dr. Ivanka Popovic, rector of the University of Belgrade, as well as Ludmir Maksovic, who is the president of the Serbian Academy of Art and Science. And I also like to, at this moment, especially greet Neboja and all his our distinguished effective Secretary General and his colleagues who organized this conference and those that were involved in supporting it, particularly those that I mentioned here. And I'd like to also mention Gary Jacobs, our CEO, who helped organize this meeting here. It is really my great pleasure on behalf of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences and the World University Consortium to especially be honored to, uh, to welcome you all to this fourth international conference on future education. Our World Academy of Arts and Science was founded in 1960, so we 60 years next year, by a group of uh, eminent intellectuals who also wish to establish <coughs> an informal world university at the highest scientific and ethical level in which deep human understanding and the fullest sense of responsibility will meet. It was not possible to do that at that time. Okay, with the information and communications today that we have, is it feasible? I think so. But global demand for higher ed education is focused to raised to an extra 100 million students over the next 15 years. It is equivalent to building <coughs> four new universities <coughs> of 40,000 students each every week during the next 15 years. But that's not going to happen. We all know that. So we decided to create a World University Consortium. First, we met at the University of California, Berkeley, and then we invited universities who were already offering distance education, hybrid education, and experts from the Silicon Valley in California. The World University Consortium was finally formally announced and created at a meeting at the Library of Alexandria in Egypt. We thought that was a good place to start our conference. Okay, we organized a second conference as Mr. Alexander already met in Rome we had 300 participants there. 
We had the next conference in my country, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I was one of the organizers. We had 272 participants. I don't know how many we have here in this conference, but we'll wait for a few more days to know that. But I want to remember, all of you, that a new agenda for sustainable development was adopted in September 9, 2015 in Paris, France, by 193 states of the United Nations. The purpose of it was to wipe out poverty through 17 development goals by 2030. Very optimistic. Education is captured by goal number four, to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning opportunity for all. So in addition to training young generation for jobs which are not there and for professions that still do not exist, UNESCO has spelled out some global education challenges and they were said as following. Yes, I'll give you some numbers now. 69 million new teachers are needed to reach 2030 goals. That's a major challenge. Second, 758 million adults lack any literacy skills. Two thirds of them are women. 39 billion US dollars is needed in extra aid assistant aid development. A six-fold increase to fulfill the finance gap we have today. 263 million children are out of school today. So, and only 14% of the youth which complete secondary education in low-income countries, 14% only. So, these are big challenges. Big challenges indeed for all of us here in Belgrade. Although I will retire as president of the World Association at the end of this month, I'm now 91 years old, four months and my 92 anniversary, so I decided that it's time to retire. I will be following the results of your ideas for the education of our great grandchildren and their children by the end of this century. I wish good luck to all of you and lots of success at this particular conference. World Academy of Arts and Science and the World University Consortium will help you. Let's face this challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you especially to Ivo Slaus and Gary Jacobs who challenged me to come and help this association. Good luck to all of you. Delighted to be here in Belgrade. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gorlino de Souza. And now I would like to call uh, Ms. Anna Brnabic, the president of uh, the Serbian government, uh, uh, to take a floor and to make address to the audience. Dragi Aleksandr, hvala vam mnogo. Dear guests, uh, first I will uh, just say that uh, although uh, according to the protocol when I'm as the Prime Minister when I'm in uh, Serbia, uh, I should speak in Serbian out of this time, out of respect for our co-organizers uh, and uh, uh, Honorable uh, President de Souza, uh, your colleagues, your team, and since it's an international conference I will speak in English. Um, Honorable President uh, of the Serbian Academy of Arts and Sciences, Mr. Kostic. Honorable President of the World Academy of Arts and Science, Mr. D'Souza. Honorable Director of the University of Belgrade, Ms. Popovic. Mr. Neskovic, Mr. Vlahovic, uh, Mr. Djuricin. Representatives of the Serbian Association of Economists, distinguished guests, professors, uh, students, um, their friends and colleagues. I have to say that uh, uh, for me, it is a great honor and a great privilege to speak about the future of education in the building which gathered through decades and in the Serbian Academy of Arts and Sciences, for all, which gathered for almost 178 years, the greatest minds not only of our country, but of this part of Europe. 
And I want to thank also the World Academy of Arts and Sciences for deciding that, as we heard from Mr. Vlahovic, following Berkeley and then Rome and then Rio de Janeiro, you selected Belgrade and Serbia to host this important event. And I would like to think that at least to some extent, this is a testimony of our reforms and of our efforts to change, but also of the strength and the potential of our arts, of our scientists, creativity, and overall of our people. Throughout the world's history and the history of humankind and nation states, <coughs> what determined the success of one nation, of one society, and of individuals was education. But in today's fast-changing world, success, competitiveness, harmony, and also happiness of one society and one country more than ever, I think, depends on education. And of our ability to predict and to adapt to the future of education and challenges that it brings with it. This surely represents one of the key challenges for the countries and for governments across the world that need to reform our education system in order to make our younger generations ready for the jobs and the world of the future. The jobs and the world which do not yet exist today. And as we have heard also from Mr. Vlahovic, we cannot today even imagine or predict which way will they be like. And that is why education and the future of it is a topic which is amongst my government's top priorities, if not the most important one. I strongly believe that only a society based on knowledge, innovation, culture, creativity, and free-thinking individuals can be a driving force of development. And the foundation of all of this is the quality of education. The changes that are happening in the world today are above all rapid. They're of such a character that it is often difficult for people to understand their scope and scale. We are faced with completely new technologies, with, with artificial intelligence, virtual, augmented reality, blockchain, big data analytics, and all of this requires education to change and adjust almost at the same pace. And I would like to think that in this government's mandate, we have started those necessary reforms of our education in order to prepare young people in Serbia for jobs in the 21st century. And the most important thing is the systematic approach and the systematic support. For this reason, we have decided that our efforts should in particular be focused on developing the unified information system for education, which will help us connect our education to our labor market so that we can track individual students' progress through the system. Which profiles and levels of education they opt for depending on the school that they attend? How long they wait for employment based on the high school profile or study program that they have completed? What is their average salary once they're employed? And how fast as a country, all of us together, we get return on investment into each single individual in our society. And what was amazing to me, if I might add, when I became the prime minister, was that we never knew, and to this date, we still don't know how much money we invest in each of our students, in each of our school kid. How much money do we invest in them? And how fast that investment has its in return to us as a society. Once we implement this unified information system, 
We will make our education completely transparent. We will know how much we invested in each single person in this country and to what extent that investment returned to us and at what pace. And based on that, have we made the right investments? How can we change those investments? How, we, how can we make those investments better? Because the best thing we can do as a society is basically invest in people. We have also started at the same time in parallel with that, changes on all levels in education in Serbia. Together with UNICEF, we have impl implemented curriculum reform in preschool education, which provides more project-based learning and play-based learning in kindergartens, stimulating research, curiosity, and critical thinking. And our key goal for our educational reform is to teach our young people how to think and not what to think. And because this is so important and is basically our key challenge, I will also say this in Serbian. Naš osnovni cilj je da napravimo obrazovni sistem koji neće učiti decu šta da misle, nego kako da razmišljaju. And this is, I think, in the root of all challenges in terms of educational system reform, at least in Serbia. There have also been a lot of work done and investments in school infrastructure and equipment in preschool institutions. We have, for example, started supplying our kindergartens with B-bots to develop algorithm thinking in children. And our plan is for all kindergartens in Serbia to be fully equipped with B-bots within the next three years. The curriculum reform has also been implemented in primary and secondary education, outcome-oriented learning, project teaching, and elective subjects. In line with digitalization, to which we are very committed, we bring internet to every school classroom. Starting from this school year, we have introduced high-speed high-speed wireless internet access to 500 schools, and we have already budgeted for the next 500 schools in 2020. To have our schools fully digital across Serbia by 2021. We currently have 10,000 digital classrooms with about 200,000 students attending classes in cities and towns across Serbia. And the results, I'm happy to say, are excellent. Both students and teachers are satisfied. Teaching is much more interactive and much more interesting. And this way of learning is much, much more attractive for younger generations, and knowledge is much more easily accepted. We have worked diligently and patiently to introduce specialized IT departments in high schools. And this was completely inconceivable until just five years ago. Now, we have around 1,000 schools, one, sorry, 1,000 students across high schools in Serbia in specialized IT departments. IT and programming became compulsory subjects in Serbia from the fifth grade in prim primary schools, which is when kids are 10 and 11 years old. Today, in the fifth grade in Serbia, kids uh, learn Scratch as mandatory subjects, in the sixth grade, they learn Python as mandatory subject. In the seventh grade, Pi game. And as of next school year, September 2020, they will learn Jupiter <laughs> as mandatory subject. Meaning that in 2021, we will have first generation of primary school kids leaving schools in Serbia with complete knowledge of all key programmatic program languages. And in this, Serbia is currently one of the most advanced countries in Europe. We are also developing dual education to have a more, um, a more communication, a better connection between our education and our labor market, our economy. We have now enrolled second generation of students in dual programs. And the results here also are fantastic. 
Around 80% of all the students who attended dual education programs are employed immediately after completing secondary school, while the other 20% opted to continue their education. Because we need this also, 100 million euros for investments in infrastructure for innovation, research and development, and startups. We are investing in science and technology parks, innovation labs, um, new infrastructure for faculties, startup centers across Serbia, and we hope that all of this will provide actually results in 2021, also in terms of much more investments in entrepreneurship in Serbia and Serbian youth investing into their startups and innovation companies. And again, our task is to teach young generations how to think, not to be afraid to question things and question authority. Think critically, push the boundaries of everything they know. This is our obligation, our obli obligation to equip them with the 21st century skills that they need. It is up to us to explain to them that they should not have to fear to rise up to challenges and make mistakes, because mistakes are good. Mistakes are just one stepping stone from the final success. And finally, the events like this help us achieve these goals. And again, we face with really much the same challenges, uh, similar issues that all governments across the world face. And these challenges and these issues are so difficult and so complex that at the end of the day, you can resolve them only by working together. The governments cannot do this alone. We need the academy to support us in this. We need business people to support us in this. We need civil society. And thank you so much again for hosting this event in Belgrade, in Serbia. And again, we hope this is a testimony to all the efforts that we are making to change us and our society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bernabic, and I think that now my and uh, Mr. Souza's job is finished at this point of time. I would like to call uh, Nebuša Nešković, Mr. Nebuša Nešković, to chair inaugural speeches. Nebuša, please. We are going back. Yeah. The next part of the introductory session will be devoted to inaugural speeches. There will be two inaugural speeches, and I'm asking Professor Vladimir Kostic, President of the Academy, Serbian Academy of Sciences. Uh -huh. Well, I'm asking Professor Vladimir Kostic, President of the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts, to deliver the first speech. Please. Poštovani članovi Srpske akademije nauke i umetnosti, dragi gosti. The protocol is also demanding for me to speak at least the first sentence in Serbian, but I will continue, of course, in the official language of this meeting, English. There is a sarcastical sentence that the wise people, people with wisdom, and I'm not pretending to be one of them, are able nowadays, in the fluid times we are living, to recognize or anticipate only the contemporary moment. So the future of education is something I cannot help actually with my discussion, but I will allow myself to think aloud in general terms about the topic that preoccupies me, about the future of university. 
and this by Lesha Kolakovsky's essay written far back in 1996 entitled Why University? He listed a number of points, just to mention a few. First, to what extent it is, is it desirable that university operates in line with the so-called social needs or even direct tasks imposed by the government or industrial co corporations, labor market, or the like? If utilitarian position won, would this bring about the collapse of university? You can understand from the first sentences that I'm a bit conservative. Second, how to oppose undoubtedly harmful and but mostly inevitable division into two cultures, humanities and science, when it is present both among students and the teaching staff? University should persevere in the position that all scientific challenges are interdisciplinary and that the social studies and humanities probably play a key role in overcoming the gap between different disciplines. Third, what is university politicization and in what sense it should be allowed and in what sense it actually suffocates its operational essence? On a very principal level, ever since 18th century, war was waged to liberate university from ecclesiastical and theological oversight in Europe. If the war had not been won, we would have become an irrelevant anachronism and spiritual culture would have moved elsewhere. I believe that nowadays we are also faced with a key issue of recognition and identification of new forms of pressure that university suffers, still political and still ideological as before. Fourth, to what extent students and some other others for that matter, directly and indirectly interested groups should participate in decisions made by the university. Considering an eternal issue of excessively difficult curricula, Kolakowski noticed that the worst way of university management is to reduce the requirements with a noble idea but eventually making people miserable. If our civilization should exist, the lives of students and their professors cannot be easy. Globalization may prove to be a fundamental challenge faced by university in its long history. Although the opinion that it is in this society of knowledge that we aspire to, the institution of university will reach new peaks. Some skeptic predicted that if this, it survived at all, university will be nothing like the institution it used to be, accusing particularly the growing market of academic and research staff, internalization of curriculum, as well as commercialization of inter international flows of higher education. The new concept of economy of knowledge highlights the need to direct the education of students to development of skills and competencies for a global workplace, including a workplace anywhere worldwide. Students have to be prepared to continuously adapt themselves to the labor market where technological innovations spring up almost on a daily basis where responsibilities continuously change, where vertical management is replaced by networking, where information passes through numerous, frequently informal channels, and where strategies are particularly complex since markets expand beyond state borders. Therefore, education has to incorporate assistance to individuals to perform tasks that they have not been originally trained to accomplish, to prepare them for non-linear career course, to improve their competencies as team players, to use information independently, to develop capacity for improvisation, and finally, to develop foundations for complex thinking as a response to the adverse reality of life. I can only say via Victis. University is the key place for synthesis of education and research activities. The question is, is this a match made in heaven or a marriage of convenience? Gibbons and associates warn us that the very idea of science may be deconstructed. New paradigms of knowledge production are primarily characterized by the importance of context, not only in terms of the final application of science, defining scientific problems and selecting pertinent methodology, but to redefine the relevant, usable knowledge that is, as the author said, socially robust, whatever does it mean. The relationship between science and innovation is defined as ecosystem, where health of the whole depends on the health of components, and more importantly, health of the relationship. In recent years, we have heard repeatedly that fundamental sciences are a kind of luxury, difficult to sustain in small countries like Serbia, 
and that innovation are more sensible and thus preferable. This is just an oversimplification of innovations because innovations cannot be created without development of fundamental research. Sorry. In developed countries, in spite of an impression that funding is shifted to applied research, analysis revealed completely the opposite. In the last two decades, the pendulum swings toward a fundamental research. I still vote for the university as an institution, institutional analyzed form of the very special biological capacity of humans, curiosity as a spontaneous reflex, ability to understand the world for the sake of understanding it only. In the 80s and 90s, we faced trends of education, corporization, and informal education. They had a fairly streamlined objective to reshape education into practice procedure to provide for a desired outcome. In a certain number of countries, these processes are accompanied with significant privatization of education. As long as 20 years ago, Middlehurst pointed out that the so-called corporate classroom is as big as the whole educational system of the United States. Some of these institutions are named Corporation University, which the author interprets as a compliment. The importance of university brand is therefore recognized, but also as a threat. Illustrating promiscuous nature of the term and potential instability of categories that we use in our educational system. Some believe that these threats are only the tip of the iceberg and the major, uh, the, the, that the major rivals of universities will be the mass media, the so-called infotainment industry and consultancy companies that will be more flexible than universities and organize global alliances faster. To put it briefly, globalization processes and relevant high techno technology alongside have translated the traditional concept of time and place into a single category. This is a special problem for universities since in spite of more or less successful methods of distant learning and the like, this, this institution is deeply rooted in its place. Is the relative autonomy of the university compromised with the advent of new paradigms of knowledge production? Vandich particularly identifies public debates about certain scientific outcomes via online blogs and social networks, when opinion of any participant apparently carries the same weight as opinion of expert, as Tim Nichols perceived, this is a room to death of expert opinion. In this situation, what can this traditionally public, particularly scientific, educational, and art-promoting institution do? In 2018, statement of all European academies, ALIA, finds that the concept of transformation into digital society is also split. In this phase of tradition, public institutions will be forced to redefine themselves to be able to grow root into the new and uncertain grounds characterized by big data platforms, algorithm-led management, and global internet presence and activities. In an online society, institutions may be easily bypassed by platforms, knowledge replaced by search and information, shallowly equalized with data. This transformation may almost imperceptibly the stabilize institutional activities that provide the and enabled integrity, transparency, autonomy, and reliability, which we believe university does. Yesterday, I told a story about Umberto Oko, who commented on a provocative question of a student addressed to his professor. Sorry, but at the age of, it, of the internet, what is your purpose here? In the background of this rude brazenness, there was an idea that the internet was the magna mater of all encyclopedia. To put it simply, almost everything is there, except for instruction of how to investigate, filter, choose, accept, or reject. Being a university professor, Echo was offended by the question and said that everybody with good memory can store new information. But much larger skills are needed when it comes to deciding what to memorize and what to forget. Conservatively, I believe that schools we'll have to go back to the Socrates and Plato's idea of a dialogue that does not prescribe truth but seeks it, seeks it, does not enthrone it but investigate it, naturally in the shadow of uh, unavoidable old-fashioned ethics, a sentence that today we have too much mind, too little character just came to me. It is my opinion that only school and university, I think in a generic term, can instill the meaning of this relationship, but don't worry, it is only my opinion. Thank you. Please.
Thank you, Professor Kosic. Now I'm asking Mr. Gary Jacobs, Chief Executive Officer of the World Academy of Art and Science, to deliver the second inaugural speech. Please, Gary. Good morning. I'd like to add my thanks to all of the organizers who have made this possible, add them to the comments already made by uh, Professor Gorgolina de Souza, our president. I'm really delighted to be here this morning. It's about more than half a year since I had the opportunity to participate in the Caponic Conference up in the beautiful hill areas of Serbia and to listen to leaders from this country, prime minister, environmental minister, leaders of business, leaders of academia, talking about not only the challenges the country faces, but what it seeks, its aspiration, its plans, its intentions to accomplish. And I felt that that conference, uh, something special about this country, something I first felt back in 1989 when I visited for the first time, a spirit of independence, a strength, and an aspiration for excellence. And the challenges that this country's faced over the last decades that we're all so familiar with, I think are only the preparation for a very great future. And how appropriate that we should come here and be invited here uh, to talk about education, where science and intellectuality and independent thinking go deep into the tradition of this country. Education is, in my view, the most important institution that we have ever created as human beings. Education is what really separates us from the other living species on this planet. It's the system or organization we use to capture the essence of our experience in generation and after generation, to codify it, process it, condense it, and pass it on to the future generations so that each successive generation can start off with the cumulative knowledge and experience of the past and move rapidly into the future without having to reinvent not only the wheel but everything else and make all the mistakes of the past. But today, not only in Serbia, not only in this region, but all over the world, we face a new challenge that the speed and magnitude and complexity of the changes in global society are so great that our educational institutions are simply not able to keep up with the challenges before us. And rushing to teach the newest technologies or algorithms or uh, employment opportunities, however essential it is, is simply not enough to prepare us, our youth, and our societies for the future. Last night we had a, a fireside chat without the fire uh, with about 25, 30, maybe 40 participants in this conference, speakers and panelists in this conference. We didn't talk about solutions. We asked the participants to talk about the questions or the problems they think that we should be addressing at this conference, going beyond the traditional issues that are being addressed in educational conferences all over the world, in which, in fact, we have been addressing in our uh, forums and discussions. We heard many very important issues that address the issue of employment. How are we going to meet the skills gap? How are we going to uh, address the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution? How are we going to prepare youth for lifelong learning? As the prime minister emphasized, how are we going to encourage students not just to absorb knowledge passively, but to think and think for themselves? Because whatever we teach them today, whatever they learn today, it's simply not going to be sufficient to meet the challenges and complexity of the future. How are we going to re-instill 
as the core of our academic tradition, our educational system, the importance of values and character, which was there in the origins of, of education before science sanitized, with all due respect to all of us representing the scientific community, but before we sanitized uh, our life in existence to the point where we leave out the subjective dimension, which is so important to the vitality, success, survivability, and progress of the society. How are we going to address not only the issues within each academic discipline, but which Dr. Kostic mentioned in his comments yesterday, how are we going to overcome the problems from the disciplinary barriers which are so deeply entrenched, not only deeply entrenched in our structures and in our faculties, but deeply entrenched in our thinking, where we have managed to divide and compartmentalize a complex interrelated reality into so many small, we have a hundred disciplines and sub, a thousand sub-disciplines that are taught in the United States alone. And each one creating greater and greater knowledge and expertise of a special expert function while losing sight more and more from the wider connectivity with which everything has to be related. Last month, we had participated in a conference of IEEE with the systems engineers who were working on the leading edge technology in the world, who are learn nothing about what's going on in the world except technology, know nothing about the society and the impact of the society that, that's, that's being impacted by the technology or the economy than what they may learn outside the educational system because they've been focused so much on keeping up with advances in the specialized technology of their field. The World Academy looks at the big picture. We're not divided into disciplinary uh, specializations, though we have representatives of all disciplines of the arts and sciences and other professions uh, in, in our academy. We're trying to look at the global challenges we face. And we find very often, perhaps almost always, the real problems fall within the link, the interstices between disciplinary knowledge. They fall within the area where the disciplines remain separate, where their perspectives are different. We have 200 years of economic history and economic thought that until very recently considered the environment an externality. We now know, as Professor Durasin said last night, that we are now possessed with due deference to our, to our, our economy. We are the world is possessed by a fanaticism of neoliberalism, which is simply neglecting the tremendous eros eroding, corroding impact of neoliberalism on our societies, on opiate uh, addiction in the United States and suicide rates uh, in other places. Uh, which doesn't take into account that our free market system, which was originally, I believe, inspired on the principles of liberty and freedom for the individual, is now undermining our democratic institutions by creating such widening inequality and sense of alienation by parts of society. Where does it come in our education? Where are we addressing the critical issues, ecological, economic, social, political issues, and if our educational system is not doing it, who is doing it? Who is preparing our future business leaders to really understand that a financial system that's totally divorced from the real economy and, is, and as has money chasing money for profits rather than building real, creating real jobs and producing real give goods and services to meet real human needs is undermining the very fabric of our society? Who's responsible? for that discussion if it's not in the universities, if it's not in our educational system. And I don't mean to minimize the difficulty of this challenge. We have have a whole long heritage behind us. We've all been through that process of fragmented disciplinary education. We've all been raised with the idea that knowledge is something we get from outside rather than something that's born and awakened in us 
we've, we've learned to depend on the external environment to give us what we need to make us valuable, and now we have what one of our speakers last night called academic capitalism, where we put a price and value not only on knowledge, but on the human being who's been through the process. Where our greatest asset, which the prime minister, the greatest asset are our people as human beings. How far is our educational system really developing our capacity as human beings? Our emotional intelligence, our value system, our confidence, our strength, our courage to speak out. And if it's not doing that, is it really doing service to the future? We have the added capacity. We have to continue. We have to continue upgrading our skills. We have to continue adapting to our technical requirements as the society goes on. But I think if we reflect honestly, we simply know this is not enough. This is not sufficient. This is not going to solve our problems. And if, it manage, if Serbia manages to replicate and duplicate the best educational system in the world, it's going to be plagued by all of the problems that I see in my society and the other countries I see around the world because we don't, they don't have the answer. They don't have the model for the future. And my hope in coming to Serbia is this is a country with a tradition of not just thinking, but thinking for yourself and thinking differently. We need new models. We don't have to cast away the best of anything. We should receive the best of everything. But the best of everything is not enough. It's very difficult to create a new model and demonstrate it in a country the size of India, where I spend most of my time, or the United States. But we've got a, a co small, compact society here with a tradition behind it. Can't we do better and not just try to catch up? And I don't underestimate the challenge at all. We know many dimensions of that already. We know we have to have a shift in it, a radical shift from the passive education, which is teaching, to the active education, which is learning. We know we need a shift from the, the paradigm of a subject-centered education. The real thing we need to educate is not about subjects. This is not a mass production line. We don't need mass production line. We need every individual coming out of this with the capacity, unique capacities, to contribute uniquely to society. We need that change from the subject to the student. We know we have to break down the disciplinary barriers. And I would give credit to the natural sciences have done much better at it than the social sciences, where, where I'm, which I represent and which I'm working in all the time, where we've divided things so much that the very concept of the human being in economics is a different species, maybe from a different planet than the human being I studied in psychology. And frankly speaking, I'm not sure that that human being has much to do with you and I either. Uh, we've got a nice abstract knowledge divorced from the real reality. We're teaching principles, we're teaching abstractions, when what our students need is something that will give them an understanding of what's going on in the society. It's not enough they understand what's been written in the past or in the textbooks or in the laboratory. They have to understand the world they're living in, otherwise what are we giving them? We're, cre we're educating them to be another species out of place in the world like human beings seem to be out of place on our planet uh, right now, and we've got apparently serious people thinking we should move somewhere else because we've, we better give up on this one. What's wrong with our thinking and our education if we can't figure out the way to live in, uh, in a place like this and we can't live harmoniously together? And we know many other aspects of this shift. It's not enough we shift to the student. It's not enough that we educate the mind. We have to educate the mind in different ways of thinking, which are there in our tra tra past. They're there in our different civilizations. The analysis in dividing all reality down to its fundamentals has given us great scientific discoveries, but we know more and more the complexity of the world can't be resolved by reductionist mechanistic thinking. We've got to think in synergy. We've got to teach our students, our youth, to think of the whole. And it's not enough we just assemble the parts and aggregate them. We've got to be able to link it to what they're feeling subjectively. 
We need an education and a way of thinking that includes our subjective reality, not just the objective world we see around us. And these are the themes that we've been exploring in the academy and the consortium and very gratified that we have a, a wonderful opportunity with a wonderful uh, range of speakers and panelists and participants to explore them further. Because our hope is not that we, we discuss here how Serbia can catch up with uh, other countries, but how Serbia can evolve models that others need. Just three days ago, I was in Geneva representing the World Academy at a new project we're launching with the United Nations which we call, for want of a better, more clear term, global leadership in the 21st century. And our colleagues within the UN system were admitted later, I'm glad they didn't tell me beforehand, that they were very skeptical about this. It was the first time an NGO was invited to represent to UN organizations and partner with the UN on a project like this. And I didn't realize how skeptical they were about us getting a reception uh, from their colleagues within the system because there's so much cynicism today about multilateralism, about the international institutions, about the support and attitude of the nation states and the possibility of addressing the challenges that we face. Well, if our education isn't helping us face those global existential challenges, what are we preparing our youth for if we can't do that? And this project which we'll talk more about for those of you who can join us on the 14th, is how do we lead a world where nobody's in charge? Well, after all, we got this far in a world with nobody in charge because nobody's ever been in charge of the whole world. But now we seem to be grappling more and more with more centers of power uh, and influence, whether it's the business community or the governments or the international organizations or NGOs. But how do we lead together? How do we create a movement that can respond to the aspirations of the young generation, uh, Greta Thunberg's uh, generation, uh, that they want a planet that works for them? Uh, so we need a new knowledge. And those who participated in our meeting on 8th agreed on one thing. For all their training in public administration and leadership in economics and other fields of development, we don't have that knowledge today. We are not teaching that knowledge today. What could be more valuable than the next generation come out with an understanding of the world we live in and how we have to cooperate and how we have to lead not just from above down, but awaken the aspirations and release the energy and initiative of everybody from the bottom up for a value-based world. And in our discussions last night, I was so pleased at the variety of issues and questions that were raised because I think they all belong on the table. Uh, we can't look for simplistic uh, uh, solutions as if education is only there for one purpose. Education is there to bind and develop our, civil, our human civilization, and now it's emerging as a global civilization. So the challenge and responsibility is greater than ever before, and it's a waste of time to blame anybody for it. We're a species learning in the process. The only question is, can we step forward to learn all that we need to learn to make this happen? That's why the motto of the Academy is leadership and thought that leads to action. We do need a lot of action, but we need a lot of new thinking in order to ensure that that action's taking us in the right direction. And I have deepest hopes and aspirations that this conference is gonna help us do it. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, this is the end this is the end of uh, the introductory session. We are now moving to the first plenary session. Go for it. Close it. And now I'm asking Dr. Carlos Alvarez Pereira to come here.